You all are over your food comas from the week. You've slept it off. Thank you, Jay. I have to be in the middle. Did you have a good Thanksgiving? Did you see family and friends? Amen. We had a good Thanksgiving as well, even though we were moving. And uh, we, for many of you don't know this, but when we moved here, we rented our house sight unseen, and we wouldn't have chosen that house. So we found a house that's nicer and cheaper. Hey, that's good news. So that's where we are now. Thank you, all of you who helped us move. It was much needed. We could have done it without you, but it would have been a lot harder. So thank you so much. And uh, God has been so good to us this week. And I just wanted to make this announcement because I am really excited about what we're going to start uh, sharing with you all. Uh, as many of you know, you've been hearing, uh, we don't have any firm prospects yet on a new church facility. We're still looking. Uh, but as this process has gone on, God has been revealing to me and the facility steering committee more and more as we've gone along what he's leading us to. And I am excited, probably around the first of the year, we're going to roll out a message describing to you what God has placed on our hearts. But we really believe, and I think many of you believe this too, as from talking with many of you, God wants a ministry center opened in South Minneapolis. This is not going to be just about a larger church for more people to sit and come and listen to a sermon. We believe that God wants to open a place that can be open every night with multiple things happening so we can reach out to our community. And we are so excited about the prospect of what can happen in a facility like that. That's what we have begun to look for. And I am just so excited. I also believe God has blessed us with church growth and he wants us to share what's been happening here. I, I believe that this, this center, this ministry center, could be a place where people come and learn how to share Jesus with their community and do evangelism. And so I want to invite all of you, I know you've heard this before, get those pledge envelopes and give us your pledges. Some of you say, well, wait a second, what's a pledge? A pledge is not necessarily a big fat check, though we take those too. A pledge is, this is the amount of money that my family and I have prayed over, and we're going to pledge this money over the next few years to donate to this ministry center. My friends, God has gifted us with amazing talents and gifts and individuals here, and our current facility is limiting the amount of ministry that we can do. Our vision is a place where there's more room for more ministry to take place. This city needs Jesus. We're seeing the results of it. And so please get those pledges in. We need your pledges. We need your help. Even if you think, oh, I can only just help a little bit. We need all of those pledges and soon. So a pledge is not necessarily a check. A pledge is a commitment, a promise to give a certain amount of money over, over a period of time. And we need every one of you. I don't see too much excitement about that. Maybe you're thinking about that. I'm excited about that. <laughs> because that is some good news. This is not some, you know, Okay, don't get me started. I'm going to preach about that later. But church is not just about a place where we come and we, we, we listen to a message and then we go home. The kind of facility we're looking for is a place where we can reach, we can really reach this community, this city for Jesus. We have an opportunity. Let's all get on board and do it. Amen. Pray that, keep continuously praying for us to find that facility. And please get on board with our vision and, and uh, get those pledges in. Okay, that's over. Had to say that. I'm excited about this message today because I am thrilled when I learn something new, especially about something that I thought I knew everything about. And then you open the Word and you're like, whoa, I never saw that before. God had so much more to teach me about this passage or this truth. And that's something that we're going to look at today in John chapter 8 about what Jesus says about himself and what it really means. But as we unravel this and as we unpack this, what we're going to see is that the Bible is incredibly, and, and to me, increasingly becoming clear, more relevant to the day in which we're living. A lot of people think, well, you know, the Bible was written thousands of years ago. It doesn't really apply to my life. This Jesus character, you know, he's kind of irrelevant and 
and I don't really understand how his life applies to me. What we're going to see after we, take, after we go through this study is that the issues that Jesus was dealing with in his day are the exact same issues that we're dealing with today. They looked a little bit different, they sounded a little bit different, but at their core, at their base, at their foundation, they were exactly the same. And so what Jesus was challenging people with in his day is what he's challenging us with. The hope that he was trying to give in those days is the hope that he's trying to give us today. That will be our study. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for Jesus because we know that as we see him, we know you better. We know that he is the fulfillment of your faithfulness. And we ask, Lord, that we would see him clearly, that your Holy Spirit would be here, Lord, to show us the face of Jesus so that we may know you and that way we may see your wonderful plans for our lives. Lord, you, it's your desire to confront all of our self-image, all of our sense of identity with the person of Jesus Christ. And so I ask that you would do that here with all of us here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Early on, I'm going to let the cat out of the bag. I'm going to give you the whole purpose of the message, and here it is. Are you ready for it? For all of us, the person of Jesus Christ stands to confront our sense of self-image and personal identity. You must look at the face of Jesus and say to God, God, who am I? And until we do that, Jesus may not be the God of your story. If you're wondering what that means, we'll unpack that more as we go along. But go to John chapter 8. I notice many, many of you turning there. So go, go to John chapter 8. This is the verse that I thought I had all figured out. Um, this is that very famous passage of Scripture where Jesus calls himself the I Am. Are you familiar with this passage? John chapter 8 and verse 58. Um, let's, let's go to verse, let's see. Uh, 57 to add a little bit of context. This is sort of a confrontation between Jesus and some in Israel and the religious leaders there. John chapter 8 and verse 57. Are you there? Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, what does he say? I am. Now what does that phrase I am mean? Well, that comes, goes all the way back to Moses in the burning bush. This was the name that identified God as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the self-existent one, the transcendent one, the God of their monotheism. And what we're going to see is the God of their identity. Now, what is their reaction? Are they like, oh, wonderful, it's nice to meet you. Is that the reaction of, the, of Israel and the religious leaders there in Jesus' day? What is their reaction to this, to this phrase, the statement of Jesus? Then they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them and, and so passed by. They literally, because Jesus called himself the I Am, they wanted to kill him on the spot. They wanted to pick up stones and kill him. And I used to believe, until recently, that the reason, the sole reason that they wanted to stone Jesus was simply that here was a man calling himself God. It was blasphemy. It was grounds to kill him. But I want to submit to you today that that is not the real reason they wanted him dead. In fact, the idea of a divine man was not actually a foreign concept. You see, a lot of us have the idea that, 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 that Israel, especially in the first century, didn't understand the concept of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity, as some call it. Um, they didn't understand that concept. So when Jesus came along and said, I'm God, they had a problem with that. How can God be in heaven and how can God be on earth at the same time? I want to submit to you that that was not what infuriated them, made them murderous. Let me give you a, a little example of that. Go to Isaiah chapter 9. Now, let's ask this question as we're turning there. Was there a lot of confusion about who the Messiah and what the Messiah would be, yes or no? Of course there was. You had the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Essenes and the Zealots and all these different groups, and everybody had a little bit different idea of who Jesus would be or, or who, who the Messiah would be, who the Christ would be, and what he would be like, what his mission would be. Some people believed that he'd be the suffering servant. Some people believed he was just a man. Some people believed he was a military leader. And others believed that he was divine. The concept of a divine man wasn't all that foreign. Caesar called himself divine. 
throughout all of the ages, the concept of a divine man was within culture. And especially because Israel itself was looking for a divine man. Go to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. When you're there, say amen. We read this passage a lot this time of year. For unto us a child is what? Born unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. What's the next, next phrase? Mighty God. His name shall be called Mighty God. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This is speaking of the Messiah, and it says that the Messiah would be called what? Mighty God. He would be divine. In the minds of many, they were looking for a divine man. It wasn't that foreign of a concept. In fact, there is extra-biblical evidence, first-century extra-biblical evidence, that Israel was, in fact, looking for a divine man. Simon bar Kokhba, one of the false messiahs that came along, called himself divine. It wasn't a foreign concept for them. They understood that the, the Messiah could be, but they were very confused about what it would be. So what is it, then that makes them so angry if the idea that a man could be divine, what makes them so angry? Go to Deuteronomy with me, and let's begin to paint this picture. Deuteronomy chapter 6, back to our scripture reading. Now, what we are about to read in Deuteronomy is the retelling of the covenant, the retelling of the commandments. Moses is basically outlining to Israel what man's relationship should be like with him what this give and take would be, what this life with the one true God would be like. You all are so quiet today. Everybody's quiet. Deuteronomy chapter 6, too much uh, stuffing or something, I don't know. You're stuffed from the stuffing. We won't do any weigh-ins on the way out, it's okay. You are really quiet today. <laughs> Carrying around a little extra from the feasts. Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is what Moses says. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is what? The Lord is what? That's like five of you. The Lord our God is one. Thank you. The Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your what? Put it in your heart that the Lord our God is one. Now, I want, I want to break this apart a little bit for you. Would the oneness of God confuse them about the Godhead? I submit to you, no. And here's why. Right in the creation story, it says the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the deep. There are multiple accounts in the Old Testament of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, some people get a little bit confused in the New Testament when they're looking for the, 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 the term Trinity. Some people don't like that term, but we'll just use it for our purposes here today. The, the, the term Trinity in the New Testament, they say, why, doesn't, why isn't there a, 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 a clear delineation or a clear outline of the, the, the doctrine of the Trinity in the, in the New Testament? And here's why. I'm going to submit to you. Because it was a given. The biblical authors didn't spend time describing or explaining something that was already accepted. It wouldn't make sense. It would be a waste of time. People say the same thing about the explanation of the Sabbath in the New Testament. Now, there are several verses throughout the New Testament that show us very clearly the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the, the Godhead, the Trinity. But people say the same thing about the Sabbath in the New Testament. Why doesn't Jesus restate, restate the Sabbath commandment? Because why would Jesus spend time trying to prove the validity of the Sabbath to people who already kept the Sabbath? You following that, yes or no? Who is he speaking to in the New Testament? Mostly Israel. Did Israel have a problem keeping the seventh day holy, yes or no? Absolutely not, but do you know what he does do? He reforms the Sabbath. So by reforming something that was already a given, he actually affirms that commandment. You following me? So... Here in the New Testament, there, people look for it. They want this clear explanation of the Godhead. Number one, I don't think any human being can clearly explain the Godhead. Amen? That's why a lot of us struggle with it. But number two, because they had been understanding... By the way, the word Elohim, which is the word God throughout the Old Testament for, the, for Israel, it's actually a plural word. They understood the unity and the oneness of God. 
So the idea that God could be one, but made up of three persons, was not a foreign concept to them. So the hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. But I want to, to shoot you to see this. This verse is quoted in multiple Jewish prayers. Many Jewish prayers begin, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This verse is not just simply a theological concept for Israel, especially beginning in this day. This verse becomes an identity for an entire nation. They became the people of the one God. And I want you to think about how this begins to work and begins to formulate. If there's one God, how many creators are there? One creator. And if there's one creator, who's in control of the story of life? That one God, right? And if there's one God in control of the story, how many wills are there? One God, one creation, one will, one story. And who was part of that story? Israel. So they saw themselves as part of the story of the God of monotheism. They believed that they were inserted into the narrative of the story of the one God. Are you following me here? And they thought that God's faithfulness would be evident through what he does through them. So you have one God, one creator, one will, one law, one covenant, one people, one way of life. This became the way they washed their hands. It became who they associated with. It became who they married. It became who they could eat at their dinner table. It was an identity for them. And it delineated them or separated them from the rest of the, the world's cultures. Why? Because every other world religion was what kind of a religion? Monotheism or one God? Or polytheism, many gods? What were they? Polytheism, they believed in many gods. So I want you to think about how this, this separates them. If there are many gods, how many accounts of creation and life are there? Many. If there are many gods, how many ways of life could there be? Many. If there are many gods, how many chosen people could there be? Many. You're seeing how this, this fundamentally separates them and how they grasp life itself. You see, for us, faith is about belief and, and what we understand and the faith that we have. For Israel, and even to this day, especially Orthodox Jews, it's not just what you believe, it's who you are. Amen. It's how you understand yourself and your sense of who you are. It's how you wash your, your vegetables and your meat. Kosher homes have two sinks. You following me? Has anybody ever been in a kosher home? You've seen a kosher home before? It's, it's how you wash and how you prepare your food and who you associate with and who you talk to and what you can and you can't eat. It's everything about yourself. It's the clothes you put on. It's how you put those clothes on. It's how you plant your crops. It's what kind of animals you have on your farm. It's what you can go near and what you can't touch. It's all of these things. It's who you are as a person. That's how Israel understood, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now I want, you to I want to take you back to John chapter 8. What is it that made them so passionately murderous by what Jesus said? John chapter 8. Are you all warm? Because some of you are sleepy. And I'm trying. I'm trying to keep you awake. This is good stuff, I promise. Go to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. All right. Let's begin a little bit further up in the chapter to give us a little bit more context. Look at verse 48. So this is this confrontation between Jesus and the Pharisees, between Jesus and Israel. Notice what he says in verse 48. Then the Jews answered and said to him, Do we not rightly say that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? <laughs> That's a nice greeting. Welcome to church. You're a Samaritan and you have a demon. Here's your bulletin. Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. 
And I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. And the Jews said to him, No, we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead and the prophets. And you say, If anyone keeps my word, you shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead, and the prophets are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? Mm. Notice what they don't ask. They don't say, what do you make yourself out to be? They say, who do you make yourself out to be? In other words, they're saying, who do you think you are? Now, had they seen him heal people, yes or no? Had they seen him perform miracles, yes or no? The idea of divinity is not the issue. They're asking him, what God do you think you are? Where did they find their identity? In the God of monotheism, who wrote the story, who was the creator, who had the will, who had the law, who they were part of that story that the one God was writing in life, right? So who do you think you are, Jesus? You following me here? Verse 54, Jesus answered, I honor my father, my honor is, my honor is nothing. If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is our, your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you, but I do not know him. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You're not even 50 years old, and you've seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. You get what he's saying to them? He's saying to them, I am your God. I am the God of your story. I am the God of creation. I am the God of the will. I am the God of the covenant. I am the God of your identity. You see, Israel wasn't as much concerned with the concept of a divine man. They just didn't want this man to be divine. Because if this man is divine, we don't even know who we are anymore. I don't know what my culture is for. I don't know what my... St Why? Because we thought it was about being an obedient, healthy, wealthy Jew. And this man came along saying things like, blessed are the poor in spirit. And he ate with prostitutes and sinners. He's associating with people that clearly the, the one God, the God of our monotheism, clearly banned from us being around or eating with or even associating with. If this guy is God, if this guy is the I am, then it's like God has rocked the foundations of the earth and turned it upside down. We don't even know who we are anymore. It's like saying, I think I might be from another planet. I can't even, it's hard for us to grasp. You would almost have to take, for those of us that are, that are very much into our cultural heritage, and you live out your cultural heritage, whether it's, you know, Irish or, or, or from, we're from Kenya or we're from Korea or from where, wherever you are. It's almost like someone coming and saying, you know what, you're not Korean. You're actually something completely opposite from what you thought you were. How you relate to the world, how you speak, the people you relate to, who you're supposed to marry, none of what you understand about yourself applies anymore. That's why they wanted to kill Jesus. It wasn't that he was claiming to be divine. He's saying that he is the God of their identity. Whew. Not only is he saying he's the God of their identity, he also comes along and he says, you know the story of Israel? That's not really about you. It's actually about me. He was the true Israel. He is the true seed of Abraham. Are you beginning to see how relevant this story is to our lives today? Jesus steps on the scene and he confronts Israel's perceived self-worth and identity. And I believe with all of my heart, God has to bring us to the place where he, Jesus stands in front of us and you, we see, he says to us, who do you think that I am? Who do you say that I am? 
Many of us, because we try to make the story out to be about us, look at him and say, who do you think you are? This story is about me and my passions and my will and my desires. This, this story is about what makes me happy. This story is about my career and my happiness and the Lord saying, look, I'm the one that made you. I'm writing this story and the story is about my undying faithfulness to you. Please let me show you how to live your life. We owe a lot to Martin Luther as Protestants. you believe that? We absolutely do. But Martin Luther trained us to read Paul's writings in a little bit of a biased way. When we read Luther's writings, almost immediately our minds go to what concept? Faith versus works. Isn't that true? That's what most of us see throughout Luther's writings. So when we dive into Luther, we see faith versus works, and we almost get this idea that, that uh, Paul is kind of lamenting or regretting his Judaism. It's actually quite the opposite. Paul is redefining his Jewishness. They always thought that the story of the one God included them and that they were part of the story. What Paul is actually teaching is that he's saying, look, our Judaism was wonderful. It was like a schoolmaster that was teaching us. But the problem that we had was we thought the story was about us when we were wrong. It wasn't ever about us. It was about God's faithfulness when he would come and show himself most clearly and most fully on the cross of Calvary where Jesus hung. The writings of Paul, the main, the primary purpose of the writings of Paul is to take every single Jew and us today as well to the place the same place that he went when light struck him down on the road to Damascus. To see that all, every part of his Judaism, the, what he understood, was not about him, and the story was right, that God was writing about him, but in fact, it was the story that God was writing about his own faithfulness that came to be in living flesh and blood in the person of Jesus Christ. When we only see faith and works in Paul's writings, we miss the greater theme. Paul is saying... Jesus is God. Jesus is the second Adam. Jesus is Israel. He's redefining and reshaping his heritage and, his under, and the people's understanding of what monotheism meant to be defined around and encapsulated in the person of Jesus Christ. So that they can understand themselves better. Are you ready for some verses here? Go to one of our favorite passages in Romans chapter 8. I love this. In this context, let's read a couple of passages from Paul now to see what he's really saying. We love Romans 8, 28. Probably some of you can quote it. Can you quote it? All things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose, right? And, you know, we sew it on our pillows and doilies. We put up the pretty pictures in our house and we have it on our little bookmark in our Bible, right? Because Paul's being pastoral, he's giving us hope here. What's he actually saying? What we're about to see is that, that Paul is actually telling us the story of God's faithfulness, saying that God will make good on all of his promises in the way that we know is because Jesus came, he lived, he hung on a cross, and he rose again. It's not just hope. It's not just um, um, uh, Paul being pastoral here. Romans 8, 28. Are you there? And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Ah, wonderful. Now put your mind into the, in the mindset of first century Israel here, because that's who he's speaking to. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed in the image of his Son. Whoa, okay. I, I know this, Paul. I know what you're talking about. Those that he foreknew. Remember, we're part of the story of the one God. He for, foreknew us, the people of Israel, before the foundation of the world. And we are part of the story of God's faithfulness. You see that? You see what he's saying there? The problem is, he takes the story and he takes the concept of God's faithfulness and he takes it off from the focus of the people of Israel and he's showing the proof of God's faithfulness in the person of Jesus Christ. 
Look what he says. Verse 28. For those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed in the image of his promised people. Is that what it says? He predestined to be conformed into the image of his promised people. Is that what it says? To be conformed into the image of his son that he might be the first born among many brethren. Whoa, wait a second. If I'm an obedient Jew and I wash just the, certain, just, just the right way, and if, I'm, and if I'm faithful to God, he will make good on his promise to send a deliverer and he'll deliver us from the Romans. God will show his faithfulness through his people. That's not what he's saying. What he's actually saying is God has shown his faithfulness in the person of Jesus Christ. The proof is in the pudding, and the pudding is Jesus. They thought the pudding was them. This story is about our faithfulness, and we're part of this story, and because of our faithfulness, God will make good on his covenant. The Lord says, no, 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 no. The proof of God's faithfulness is Jesus Christ. And actually, this verse takes... Some of you are thinking, well, thanks for ruining that, pas that passage, Pastor, you know. He had to break it apart. It's actually more beautiful than you might have imagined. Let me tell you why. Because most of us take that verse to mean something like, well, you know, I don't understand all the horrible things that are happening to, happening to me, but, you know, everything happens for a reason. And I know that because everything happens for a reason. Listen. Sometimes the reason is there's a devil. Sometimes the reason is you made a really bad choice. Was that necessarily God's plan? No. People take this verse to mean that, you know, my loved one died. It was part of God's plan. Dying is never part of God's plan. Is that okay? I, it breaks my heart to hear people say, you know, God just couldn't spend another day up in heaven without my loved one. That breaks my heart because what a horrible picture of God that paints. God can be with people right here. So what is he actually saying? What he's actually saying is, sometimes you do not understand what's happening in your life. But this is a promise that no matter if your world is shaking, things are falling apart all around you, your feet will always land on solid rock. Why? Is it because you can figure it all out? Is it because you can make sense of it all and understand why all these bad things are happening? No! Your feet will land on solid rock. Why? Because God has been faithful. How do we know God has been faithful? Because He predestined His believers to be conformed into the image of His Son. His faithfulness, the proof of His faithfulness doesn't come in how well you can explain your life. The proof of God's faithfulness is that he hung his son on a cross and he bled and he died. That's how you know God is faithful. The story's about him. It's always been about Jesus. You see, when we think we've got it all figured out and we can understand it all, everything happens for a reason, it's almost like we're taking on the mindset of Israel. If I'm faithful enough, if I can figure it all out, if I can just not doubt through this time of despair, if I can just have enough faith or I can just believe enough or I can just pray hard enough, then I know that it'll all make sense. What Paul says is, look, you're living in a, a sinful world. You can't figure this out. But what you can know is that God is faithful and He will be faithful yesterday, today, and forever because of Jesus. He might be fir the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these also he called. Whom he called, these also he justified. And whom he justified, he also glorified. Your hope doesn't come in understanding what's happening in your life. Your hope comes in a, a Savior that lived, died, and rose again. I love this passage because it keeps going. And what, what's left is even more beautiful. Look at this. And what shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Now remember the mindset of ancient Israel. God would never give up on his covenant people, right? 
That, that was the message. God would never give up on his covenant people. So the question might be, well, if this covenant was always about Jesus, if his faithfulness is seen in Jesus, where does that leave us, the people of the one God? Paul takes that promise and he refocuses it and makes it even more beautiful. Look what he says. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? In other words, the faithfulness of God to his people has not gone away. That promise isn't done away with in Jesus. In fact, it's affirmed. It's ratified. Keep going. Verse 32. He who did not spare his own son but believed, but, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Remember what Paul says in another place? All the promises of God in Christ are what? Yes and amen. He's saying the same thing here. He's saying, look, all those promises, the promise of protection, the promise of, of, of deliverance, the promise of, of, of God delivering on his faithfulness hasn't gone away. He's still the God of monotheism. It's just not the God that you were hoping to see. It's not the God that you were expecting. None, none of that has gone away. It's just been redefined and refocused. He keeps going. Look at this. Uh, verse 33. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Who did they think was God's elect? Israel, right? Here he's saying that Jesus is the firstborn among God's people. All that are faithful, no matter your tribe, your nation, your tongue, the color of your skin, who your mama and daddy are, what kind of blood that runs through your veins, whether you're rich or you're poor or you're struggling or you're addicted or you're tried or you're tested, Jesus died for you and he can be your older brother to deliver you from whatever this world might throw at you. Abraham's family comes from every corner of this globe. Verse 34 who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and further is also risen. Okay, I love this. Jump down to verse 37. Okay? So the question is, is our monotheism wrecked? Do we understand this? God made all these promises. How do we still understand ourselves differently from polytheism? Verse 37. Yet in these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen? Listen to this. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We love that passage because it's so pastoral, but I want you to see what Paul's doing there. He's showing again that God has shown his faithfulness through Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is the God of the promises. He's delineating himself Again, from the gods of polytheism, because if you look at this passage, everything that's listed there, those, the pagans who believed in polytheism, there was a god prescribed for all of those things. Death and life, were there, was there a god for death in paganism, yes or no? Was there a god for life in paganism, yes or no? Was there a god of angels and supernatural beings, yes or no? Principalities and powers, yes or no? present, so were there gods in charge of the present and the future, yes or no? Are you still with me? Height or depth? Any created thing, things that happen on the earth, created beings, were there gods for that, yes or no? So what he's saying is, look, the power of God to write this story hasn't changed. All of those promises, all, all those other religions look to all these different gods, he's saying, look, the promises of God in Christ are yes, Nothing has changed except we see that it's true in the person of Jesus Christ. All of those things would have been ascribed to other gods, in multiple gods in polytheism. And what he's saying is, all that we believe, that God's in control, that God's writing the story, that God's got today and God's got tomorrow, that nothing can separate us from his love, that God is faithful. How do we know? Is it because of us and our faithfulness? No, it's because of the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. That's how we know it's true. And that's how we know God's got us. And that's how we know he will never let go. One more passage, are you ready? Are you ready? Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Now, I used to use this passage when I was doing evangelism and calling people to you know, join the church and things like this. Boy, did I miss the point. 
Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1. Are you there? I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling which were you were called. Yes, we're part of the story. Paul says, hold on a second, the calling isn't quite what you expected. Remember, because the story's about Jesus. With all obedience and wealth. Is that what it says? With all haughtiness and pride. Because that's the way they went about it before. With all lowliness and gentleness. With long suffering, bearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in the hope of your calling. By the way, all of these, these presentations about the, uh, the one church and being one body, guess where that comes from? The story of monotheism, one God. One God, one Savior, one body, one people. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. That's what he goes on to say. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all, through all, and in all. And notice what is he, what, how, how he affirms this. He says, look at it now, verse 7, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. The Spirit dwells in you. How do I know the Spirit dwells in you? Because of the faithfulness of God. How do I know God is faithful? Because of me? Because the story's about me? No. I know God is faithful, and I know He will make good on His promises because of the person of Jesus Christ. My friends, our hope and peace does not come from our fanciful, our fanciful explanations of life. It comes from knowing that Jesus really lived, and Jesus really died, and Jesus really rose again. You see what Paul did there in Ephesians chapter 4? Again, he focused on Christ being the God of their monotheism. Jesus being the Elohim. Jesus is Adonai. Jesus is Jehovah. Jesus is Yahweh. He is the I Am. And think about the faithfulness of God, my friends, when you realize that the God of the universe, the God of all the vast creation, we're not even a speck on a speck on a speck in the vastness of his universe, but the God in heaven is so faithful that he would send a part of himself to this world to ratify his faithfulness, to affirm his faithfulness to all who would believe. Actually, if you think about it, it wasn't just his faithfulness to all who would believe. He affirmed his faithfulness to the whole world. Even to those that would be lost, God was still being faithful. So, the question stands for us just like it stood for first century Israel. Who do you say that he is? The best illustration that I can come up with is when Jesus called himself the I Am, it was like he took a snow globe, he turned it upside down, and he shook it. And that's what the world became like for Israel when they realized that Jesus was the God of their faith, that Jesus was the God of their identity. I believe with all of my heart that God wants to bring us to a place where he takes our life like a snow globe. We see the face of Jesus, he turns it upside down, and he shakes it. But remember, all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. No matter how crazy that snow globe gets, your feet will always land on solid rock. How do you know? Because you have an explanation? No. Because you know that God has been faithful. How do we know that God is faithful? Because of Jesus Christ. By the way, the book of Revelation talks about having the faith of Jesus. Do you know what that really means? Seeing the faithfulness of God in the face of Jesus. I want to ask you a question today. Who's the God of your story? Many of us, because we derive our identity and self-worth from a whole lot of other things, relationships or career or money, our family, our heritage, 
We don't allow Jesus to be the God of our story. And what Israel didn't realize was that as long as they weren't making Christ the God of their story, they were the God of their own story. So Jesus walks right up to them and he looks them in the face and he says, Look, I am. And he approaches all of us in the same way. People try, we try to find our self-worth and our identity through you know, sexuality and relationships and money and career and education and peace and our families and what kind of house we live in and what kind of car we drive. Today, Jesus walks right up to us and he says, who do you say that I am? And he's inviting us to acknowledge that he's the God of our story. Now, do you believe his promise? Do you believe he'll be faithful? Because when you acknowledge that he's the God of your story, he's going to take your snow globe, he's going to turn it upside down, he's going to shake it. But if you believe that he's faithful, your feet will always land on solid rock. Because of his faithfulness. Who's the God of your story? We struggle with the fact that how can the Bible be relevant to my life? How can Jesus be relevant to my life? The same issues they are facing in Jesus, they are the same issues we're facing today. Who do you say that he is? If Jesus is God, is that inconvenient to your life? That's a tough question we have to ask ourselves. If Jesus is God, is that inconvenient to your life? Where do you derive your self-worth, your self, your identity, your image? Paul says, look at the face of Jesus, the faithfulness of God in the face of Jesus, and you will realize that you are the pearl of great price in, Christ, in God's eyes. It's you. Your value can never come from finite things in this world. It will always be seen fully in the faithfulness of God as we look at the face of Jesus. So, who do you say that he is? It's uncomfortable to think that God's going to take your life and go like this. But that's exactly what all of us need. You really want to know who you are? You really want to know your value and your worth? then answer the question when Jesus walks up to you and says, who do you say that I am? You willing to make him the God of your life? Will you stand as we sing our closing song? <clears throat> Father in heaven today, thank you for walking up to us, looking us in the eyes and saying, who do you say that I am? Today we realize, oh God, that you are the God of our story, that you are the God of our faith, that you are the faithful one. And Lord, when the world is rocked around us and we don't know what to do and we can't explain the things around us, we know that our feet will always land on solid rock. How do we know? Because you gave us a revelation of yourself when you hung on Calvary's cross and you said, I will forever be faithful. I will never let you go. I'm the God of the story. I'm the God of creation. I'm the God of the will. I'm the God of the promise. I'm the God of faithfulness. You said, I am. And we see and we hear the name and we look and we see the face of Jesus. And there are people here today, Lord, who have been trying to find out who they are through all sorts of ways, through relationships and careers and money and worldly things, Lord, that can never provide us the hope and peace that we seek. We see today that our peace comes from the faithfulness of God, the value that we have in your eyes. And we know that it's true because Jesus really lived and he really died and he rose again. And right now he's ministering on high to show us who we are in you. Lord, so when you walk up to us each day and you ask us, who do you say that I am? May we say, you are my God in whom I have waited. I take great joy and great pleasure in knowing that you are the faithfulness of God that I can see and I can feel 
and I can touch, and I can know. May we make Jesus the God of our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit and know that there is a faithful God and He's proven it in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. May God bless you. Have a wonderful Sabbath.